three, two, one. Hey everybody, welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. Today we have Robert Kerback, the author of the book Malibu Burning, and we're going to learn all about um, something that sadly has um, is probably going to affect a lot of us. It's affecting Australia right now. Um, in California, there are a bunch of fires that happen both in Northern and Southern California. And um, it's a really important issue that I wanted to understand and hopefully we'll all understand better um, the nature of fires and what we need to know about them. So welcome, Robert. Oh, thank you, CJ. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your, um, tell me about, for people who may not even know about the Malibu fire, can you kind of give us kind of an overview of what happened, who are the people that were impacted, when it happened, and what were, you know, what were the actual catastrophic things that happened afterwards in terms of the land burned, the property loss? Sure. So uh, just over 15 months ago in November of 2018, uh, L.A. County experienced the worst wildfire in recorded history. Um, and that was the Woolsey fire. And um, at the same time, the Woolsey fire was burning and leveling uh, half of Malibu. The Paradise fire was burning or excuse me, the campfire was burning up in Paradise, California. So northern California. Mm -hmm. So. At the exact same time, we had two of the worst fires in California history. Mm -hmm. um, so it was pretty devastating for California. As you can imagine, the resources were really stretched thin. And so um, it was quite a challenge. Um, and we, my wife and son and I, um, had always known we live in Malibu. You know, fires are not... Um, you know, fires are something that happens. We have um, what we call fire season, which basically used to be just one or two months. But as the climate has begun to change and the planet's gotten hotter, um, we've had a lot of drought in California. And so fire season has kind of extended from September now, sometimes through March or April. Wow. So wow. Yeah. That's huge. Wait, yeah. so you could be at risk of a fire because of the drought from September to April? To March, April. So basically March, half. Wow. Year. Wow. Wow. And, okay. and for those of your viewers that don't know, these fires almost always are accompanied by the Santa Ana winds and the Santa Ana winds blow hot, blow in from the desert. They're hot winds. They're very strong winds. Um, during the Woolsey fire, the winds reached hurricane force, 70 miles an hour. And so these fires, if there's even one little spark, one little ember, somebody drops their cigarette on the ground catches a piece of brush on fire, you know, a, a, a branch, a tree, a twig, a piece of paper, all of a sudden these winds blow that item. And you know, when you go to a campfire and you're sitting by the campfire and you're trying to get it going, you're, you're blowing on that fire to fan the flames. And so these winds fan these flames. And so these fires can get very large and out of control like that. Right, so it's it's something unique to the California, the, the Santa Ana winds. I remember when I lived in San Francisco were like a, a phenomenon. It happens only in California, right? They're the winds that come over, but it's that mixed with the environmental conditions of the drought that kind of make this kind of a combustible combination. Yeah, okay, exactly. So, so it happened a year and a half ago. What was the actual, like, I, I don't know about the Malibu. I can't, I don't remember. I'm sorry. How was no. it started? I know one of them was a campfire, like you said. Uh, well, unfortunately, in this situation, uh, in 2018, both of these major fires were started by equipment failures from the utility companies. So in the north, it was PG&E, which is their utility provider. Here in the south, it was Southern California Edison. Both companies, their equipment failed. You know, when these winds come, they're blowing lines around. And if the lines aren't maintained, which in this case they were not, um, equipment fails, lines come down. And then these lines, the power lines, they spark. They come into contact with brush. And now you have a... Oh, I had no idea. I, I had read about the power... I, I read that it was PG, but I didn't know exactly why. So it was not maintaining the actual power lines so that they, it felt like they fell during yeah. these huge yeah. winds and that's what caused yeah. it all. Yeah. And, 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 wow. and while I'm an expert on, uh, the Woolsey fire and I've become sort of, you know, a wildfire expert, I'm not an expert on the paradise fire, but I do know that, um, it was a small clip, small clip, which held the lines, which failed, um, a clip, 
that probably cost a few dollars. Um, and because that clip wasn't checked, uh, because the maintenance wasn't done properly, because that clip failed, um, many, many mm -hmm. people died and thousands of people lost their homes. Um, and the situation here in Southern California was similar. I don't know the exact thing that failed, but Southern California has admitted uh, that it was their equipment that failed. And to make matters worse, and your viewers are gonna really love this because it's such a cheery story, to make matters worse, the Woolsey fire here in Southern California started on the site of a secret nuclear meltdown that had never been cleaned up. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so uh, now the radioactive materials in the ground were spread by the winds and the brush which had grown up on that site, which now contained those toxic materials. And now that brush was disseminated throughout Southern California. So through the air, now the air, like the, whatever was in the plants, the everything is just now with the winds, it's like yep. spreading through. Yep. And what are the, like, how do you one even measure the impact now of the, the toxins? Like, how, have they done the research to now know, like, what, how, and how does one clean up after the fact? <laughs> yeah, that, it's a mess, right? It, yeah. You know. So uh, I recently wrote an article um, on this issue for Los Angeles Magazine. Um, then based on that article, um, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the NRDC, reached out to me um, because they're very interested in this issue, too. Um, I mean, the bottom line is it's a giant mess. The bottom line is, is that the site, which is owned by Boeing, uh, should have been cleaned up years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and we're working on that. Um, it should have been cleaned up years ago. But the and, you know, when we think of California, we think of a, a state that's very environmentally uh, yeah. aware, very environmentally conscious. And one of the uh, professors I interviewed um, for the chapter in Malibu Burning that talks about this. Uh, and the, the Los Angeles Magazine article was an excerpt from my book, Malibu Burning. Um, this professor, Dan Hirsch, he called this site, um, which is it's called the Santa Susana Field Laboratory uh, in Simi Valley. That's the site that Boeing owns that's contaminated. He called it the most contaminated site in the United States. Wow. So there's just toxic materials that were resident on the site that have now blown and propagated who knows what. And yeah. And what's the result? Like, I know that you'd said that it's the results are catastrophic, but do they know the specific impact? Is it a, um, impacting the air that we breathe? Is it impacting the water? Is it going, like, what's the longer term possible impacts to us as well, human beings and the plant environment and the animal environment? I know. Yeah. So, uh, the, the short answer is we don't know because no one has done any testing. The governmental agencies have not done testing. There are actually a team of, um, what we call citizen scientists. Um, and these are people that are, um, immensely qualified, um, and are actually doing this testing on their own dime, which wow. is really, which is really a terrible way yeah. for um, our society to be finding out if, you know, uh, deadly materials are in our backyard. Right. Um, so, um, but yeah, on the Santa Susana Field Laboratory site, the EPA did a test, uh, did testing in 2012, and they found astronomical levels of plutonium-239, cesium, strontium, all of these, you know, you know, horrific chemicals that don't go away in our lifetimes. And now this fire, you know, literally started on that site. So it was basically the worst case scenario. Like what, what's the worst place for a, a massive fire to start? How about right. on the site of a secret nuclear melt? Oh my gosh. Wow. I know. Wow. Okay. So um, those are some kind of unique characteristics of this Malibu um, fire. What are some other kind of things that are specific about, this particular fire that makes it different or similar to other kinds of catastrophic events that are happening, whether it's flood. I mean, now it's like, choose your cat, you know, it's either flooding and destroying through flooding or fires, um, hurricanes. <laughs> well, know. you know, I, I, I think the, the thing, the, the reason I wrote the book is, you know, my wife, son and I, we, you know, we were prepared for fires. We had a fire pump, we had fire equipment. Wow. 
And because we had been told from the beginning when we bought our place that, you know, a fire was a real possibility. We kept our brush clear. We didn't have a wood pile next to our house. We didn't have a wood fence. You know, you know, all of these things that can increase preventative measures. Right. And it is, you know, some of them are quite common sense and others, you know, even I've learned now, you know, um, um, so we um, when this fire came through, you know, we we basically sprayed our house with this fire retardant called Mm -hmm. FOSCheck. Wow. Uh, it's the same fire retardant that the, the fire department uses. We sprayed all the foliage. We sprayed as everything we could. And then we evacuated. Mm. Uh, and our street, 17 of 19 homes burned to the ground. Um, in our neighborhood, 180 out of 275. Um, so basically, our neighborhood was destroyed. And was your house destroyed after all these preventative measures? Our house survived. Our house is a Victorian house. It is all wood. If any house should have burned to the ground, our wow. house. Wow! Wow! That burned. just gave me chills. Wow! So, do you think it was? Do you think it? Yeah. Is it from the preventative measures that you did, or who I knows? Mean, look, I think in any disaster you need a little bit of luck, but there is no doubt that spraying our house with Foscheck, having excellent brush clearance, not having flammable things around the house in the near vicinity of the house, those things saved our home. So I'm just so breathtaking by this whole idea of your house being one of the two that survived. So did your did your neighbors also do the FOSS check? Did they did they have comparable preventative measures? Um, a few did. A few did. Um, for the most part, anyone in Malibu who stayed behind and had preventative measures and did for the most part in, you know, I, I don't have an exact percentage, but I'm going to say 98 percent of the cases they saved their homes. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, and then, you know, that's one of the the, the, um, constructive and positive things I'm trying to get out there is that you as a homeowner in California, you know, with this epidemic of wildfires where we're having more fires that are more extreme, um, you know, there are things homeowners can do. Um, We call it hardening your home. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that there are very simple things to do, you know, basically, you know, don't have giant flammable trees near your house, hanging over your house. Pine, palm, and eucalyptus are um, very flammable, um, invasive. They're not native to California. They shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're really dangerous when they catch on fire. Embers go everywhere. Um, And, you know, so, you know, those are things that homeowners can do. So you can actually feel like, hey, you know what? Yeah, I'm buying this home, um, but I can do things to make it safer. And um, one of the things we're finding is that fires are burning into areas that historically weren't wildfire prone. Um, and so at this, this past year, we almost lost the Reagan National uh, Library to a fire. Right. We almost right. lost the Getty Villa in Pacific Palisades to a fire. Right. In 2017, the city of Ventura almost burned to the ground. So the idea that the city of Santa Monica couldn't catch on fire is, is no longer, we don't know. Right, who knows? Oh, Right. Like those, yeah. those those kind of rules of thumb, like you'll be fine. It's like, yeah. no, you may not. Who knows what will happen, right? Like one wind blowing in the weird direction that you're not expecting. Your whole Santa Monica area could be part of this. Scent. So so the, the the thing that firefighters spray, Frostec, is that what you said it's called? The, the Fos- chemical, yeah. Fostec. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, so is this like something that you spray around the edge of your house or like the whole house or how did like... Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, you know, my, and it's funny, my wife was the one on the fire hose um, and we have video of it and um, they had me on uh, a a morning show and uh, the, that was the thing that the anchors and the producer just thought was the most amazing is here's my wife, you know, you know, and I'm filming her and they're of course laughing at me saying, wait a second. So who's filming? And I, oh, me. And they're like, so she's on the fire hose and while you're filming everything. Yeah, it's my background in acting, so I have yeah. to be the one yeah. filming this. Yeah. Okay, so, so I, I will say I, I I took two brief videos because I knew I had to document it, and then the phone was away, and that was it. And then oh, I was no, I okay. <laughs> You're not a slacker. You're okay, no. Robert. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, so you spray these buildings. Is it like you have to spray the whole and like, where does even one get these things? Like, did you get it from the fire department? Like, how did you even get these? 
The way you get anything these days, you Google it and it comes up (laughs) online and you order it. And two days later, it's at your house. Uh, But where did you get the fire hose of stuff to put? You you order it, you know. Um, You uh, ordered a fire hose from from Amazon? Yes. yes. (laughs) Amazon Prime. Uh, I need it now, now, tomorrow, (laughs) please. The fire fire is here now, you know. Well, wow, okay. Um, wow. So, um, yeah, and and um, now I'm getting a lot of requests from my neighbors. I've actually put together a fire supplies list of supplies that we had, and then also supplies that we didn't have and we have now. You know, because there were things we wish we had, and we, you know, we, I always tell people we were somewhat prepared but completely inexperienced. Mm-hmm. Next time we're going to be far more prepared, and now we're also, fortunately or unfortunately far more experienced yeah so uh, this checklist how can um can we go to your website and get it how do we get this checklist for um i, I have my um father and um in law lives in in sonoma and they were lucky to not to be unscathed um from right. the sonoma fires right. um but it would which probably were, be good to have a checklist. Fires. yeah which were terrible fires yeah. Yeah. um is there a checklist that we you can provide yes. listeners yeah, so if you go to my website, um, robertkerbeck.com, um, and you sign up on my mailing list, I send you the um, fire supplies. Okay, good. So then you can buy those things, go to Amazon, get your fire hose, which I never knew you could even buy as an individual. Yeah, yeah you wow. get your, I mean, the stuff you could buy, I mean, you can buy pretty much anything that the fire department has. As a matter of fact, there are neighborhoods now where the neighbors have gotten together and they have bought themselves what's called a water tender because one of the big things that happens of course in fires is water is so important right and um to be able to have a high pressure hose shooting water you need a lot of water and so neighborhoods now they everybody chips in and they're buying these water tenders which are just ginormous water trucks um and so that you know, if you're a neighbor, like let's say you got 10 people on your street. Well, now, you know, you've got this truck that's got a lot of water with a high pressure hose and it can drive around and make sure it's putting out these, these spots. Wait, but I don't understand that. I guess. A... <laughs> so do you, did you, you buy actually a, a physical truck that just sits yeah. here parked ready yeah. to like go at any point in time Yeah. to spray stuff? Yeah. Wow. I mean, how much does one of these trucks cost? I just out of curiosity. You know, I don't know how much the trucks cost, but I know there's a neighborhood uh, next to mine, Malibu West, and they have they have literally like a fire brigade and guys volunteer and they undergo some training and then they all you know they have an HOA and so the HOA has you know a set money aside to have fire supplies and fire gear. Wow. You know. Okay. All right. This is fantastic. All right. Um, We're going to move to part two. We've been talking to Robert Kerbach, the author of Malibu Burning, talking about what made the Malibu fire unique and something, sadly, that all of us, I'm in the Pacific Northwest and we had fires as well. And it was really, really hard. So we're talking about um, in in part one, kind of the preventative measures that you can take from your from home buyers um perspective yes and they have they have literally like a fire brigade and guys volunteer and they undergo some training and then they all you know they have an hoa and so the hoa has you know set money aside to have fire supplies and fire gear you know Okay. All right. This is fantastic. All right. Um, We're going to move to part two. We've been talking to Robert Kerbach, the author of Malibu Burning, talking about what made the Malibu fire unique and something, sadly, that all of us, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, and we had fires as well, and it was really, really hard. So we're talking about, um, in in part one, kind of the preventative measures that you can take from from home buyers' um, perspective. Um, and some of the unexpected things that I, it sounds like the state and city are going to be smarter about things going forward. Well, <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Um, it's been it's been a little disappointing. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's just been disappointing. Um, bureaucracy and bureaucratic agencies move very slowly. Change comes very, very slowly. Um, and so that's why one of my messages to homeowners has been, look, you know, I'm from Philadelphia. You know, I don't know anything about fighting fires. Um, I I have no experience with fighting fires. I didn't go to firefighting school. I didn't, you know, 
Uh, and yet my wife, son, and I saved our home by having some basic things. And, you know, they're, they're kind of two schools of thought. And I, I present the third school in the book, you know, the two schools of thought when a fire comes, the first one is evacuate right away. Mm -hmm. And that's what most people did. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, many people and most people that evacuated lost their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this other type of person. And we have a lot of these in Malibu because sometimes people, you know, when they hear of Malibu, they think everybody's rich and famous in Malibu. And it's actually the opposite. Yes, on the beach, with the beachfront mansions, yes, those are some very rich and famous people. But in the hills of Malibu, it still is the Wild West. And it still is a lot of the homesteader mentality of the homesteaders who settled in Malibu in the late 1800s. And in the book, I talk a lot about the history of Malibu and how there always were, from the beginning, these two very separate groups. The super rich people that were living down by the beach and everybody else. Mm -hmm. And And so... When these fires come, a lot of these old timers, we call them old Malibu whites, old Malibu locals, they stayed behind and they fought the fire because they had fought many fires, you know, and those people generally save their homes. But, you know, they are putting themselves in harm's way. And so what I've been talking to a lot of people about is the third way. You know, there's there's evacuate right away and then there's stay and defend no matter what. Stay till the end. There's a third way, which is what we did, which is I call you know, prep and go so that you load your valuables into your car, your pictures, your videos, you know, your, you know, your whatever things are important to you. And you prep your house by moving anything away that might burn, spraying your house with Foscheck, putting wet towels under all of the door jams, um, um, you know, you know, again, moving anything that could burn either inside the house or far away from the house. And those steps um, can really make a tremendous difference in saving your home. Um, and then you can still evacuate and you can still be safe. What are the wet towels that prevents the smoke from getting to the next room, moving from one room to another? Embers getting in under the doors. Oh, and starting and then like spreading the fire. So if just like a tiny, so the door itself will prevent it, but then there's still the door jam. Yeah. And you know, you know, I mean, if you, if you stand by your door on a windy day, you can often feel the breeze sneaking in, right? Yeah. Getting in. Well, imagine if that if that breeze that's sneaking in is carrying embers, hot embers. One ember sneaking inside your house can burn your entire house down. And here's a story that'll give you chills. When we came back, we uh, we were out of our home. There was smoke damage. Even though our home survived, part of our roof blew off. Um, we had smoke damage. It took quite some time to clean the house. And so we were out of our house for a couple of months before we could move back in. Mm -hmm. And when we did move back in, I mean, it was a, maybe even another month or uh, two months later, we were sitting in our living room and we looked at the rug on the living room floor. And my wife noticed four or five very small burn holes in the carpet by the back door. Embers had gotten in the back door. They had okay. landed on the carpet. They had burned it. But the carpet didn't catch on fire. Oh, wow. That's how that's how close our house was to burning down. Yeah. And and the wooden doors and the flammable carpets. I mean, what there's what what do you do? I mean, because you're saying getting wooden things away from you know the right. perimeter of your house, like wooden fences right. and trees and things right. like that. But then there's things inside of your house, like the carpets and the wooden furniture and the wooden floors right. and. Right. Right. So, again, depending on how much time you have, and of course, that's a big variable, you know, a lot of times these fires, you know, they start from some distance away. So you actually have a fair amount of time. It's not it's pretty rare that it's, oh, my God, the fire is right above my house. I, I, you know, usually, you know, if you're paying attention, you're hearing the reports, you have hours. In the case of the Woolsey fire, we had, you know, 16 hours. Right. That's a lot of time to pack up your car, move uh, furniture away from the doors. Remember the wet towels. Um, I certainly would roll the carpet up because it's, it's not, um, okay. it's not, you know, attached. It's a, right. you know, throw rug. Like your new learning, right? <laughs> roll the carpet up. Right. Roll it up, move it away from the, the, the door yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those are some simple things, simple things. And it's amazing yeah. 
Um, a lot of people's homes burned down because um, their outdoor patio furniture caught on fire. Oh, and the outdoor patio furniture was right next to the house, and then those flames caught the house on fire. And that's the thing that's amazing is it's often not the house that catches on fire. It's something around the house giant palm trees, giant pine, pine trees, eucalyptus trees, outdoor furniture, wood pile, or it's an ember getting inside your vents or like we talked about under the door. And so that's another thing I recommend, ember resistant vents. You know, a handyman can install those. They're really, you know, all things considered, probably the cheapest thing you can do to save your house. Um, and, you know, that's the thing I try to, to, to say to homeowners. People go, oh, my God, there's nothing you can do. I'm, I'm like, there's easy stuff you can do right. that is going to take your percentage of surviving a fire from 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent to 80 percent, 90 percent, 95 percent, you know. OK, so what I don't understand is like it's not burning your house, you know, which is made out of wood or the big doors of which you're stuffing little towels underneath. So it sounds like it's just like small little fibers of which it catches on and then it kind of bursts into flame. Is that the nature of a fire which, and why like your Victorian house all made of wood didn't burn right. down. Right. Because think about it, you know, even though the house is wood, you know, the roofing material is fire resistant. The paints are generally fire resistant these days. So your house isn't generally going to spontaneously combust. But what happens is your outdoor furniture catches on fire. Right. And so heat starts building, heat starts building, you know, right. Cause now, the, you know, your, your, your chair catches on fire. Right. Now the, the lounger catches on fire. And so all of a sudden all this outdoor patents creating heat, heat, heat. Uh -huh. And it's, it's all of a sudden now it's hitting the deck, hitting the deck, hitting the deck, the heat's hitting the deck. And all of a sudden now the deck catches. Right. The it's like the, it's like when you start a fire in your fireplace, there's kindling, it's a small stuff that catches yeah. and then it's the log takes a while for it to burn, but it does. Okay. So the same right. idea. Right. Okay. So then that's a great analogy. Yeah. And you know, one of the things, you know, I, I wrote the book to be of service to homeowners, but I also wanted to tell the stories of the Malibu locals, a lot of these, you know, middle class people that most wouldn't think live in Malibu, these yeah. middle class people that stayed behind, that saved people's lives, mm. that saved thousands of animals' lives, mm. and saved entire neighborhoods from burning mm. down. Mm. And so I really wanted to show the heroism, because that's what we see in these disasters is, yeah, you can look at the worst, and you can look at all the terrible things that happen, and there are terrible things that happen, but I really wanted to look at how much worse it could have been if it wasn't for the people that oh, I yeah, the people that stayed behind. All right. Yeah. So I want to move to part two and talk a kind of kind of the personal effects. So we talked in the in the very first part about like preventative measures that you can take so that mm -hmm. you're prepared in and outside of the house. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been talking to Robert Kerbach, the author of Malibu Bur Burning. Um, so in, in the second part, we're going to talk about um, personal, the personal effects. So, you know, the, so I want to talk to you now about you get the 16 hour warning. I had a friend who got like a four hour warning. Yeah, so whatever yeah. you, you know, you, you get the warning that the fire is coming through and it, and I don't know how often, I don't know how long of a warning you do get, but what was running through your mind? 16 <laughs> hours. Like how did you, how did you handle, how did you decide what to take, what not to take, what to put in the car? Like how, how did that hit you personally and what did you do during the fire and how did that compare to some of you have in your book stories of other people? How does that compare to what other people did? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep it real here and tell you that I was asleep at the wheel. Okay. Uh, I was pretty pathetic. It was my wife that was really on it. Yeah. It was my wife that was following the news reports. It was my wife that was saying, boy, I'm really concerned about that fire. Um, uh, she didn't really sleep that night. I slept like a baby. Right. Um, and in the morning when we got up, she, um, and she was up very early, she woke my son up. He uh, was 16 at the time. And before she even woke me up, she had him packing the car. Um, so she was much more proactive than I was. And in the book, you know, I detail some people were really proactive and they were on it. And other people were like, ah, oh, it's, it's not going to come here. Ah, oh, it's not going to be that bad. That was me, right? Um, so lesson learned. Right. <laughs> Lesson learned, which is when you hear about a fire, 
again, you mentioned it, you said it very well earlier, you don't know exactly where it's going to go. You don't know if the fire department is going to get control of it. In this case, they did not, you know. Um, And uh, in the case of the campfire up in paradise, they did not. Um, And um, so I I think you, you always need to be prudent and err on the side of caution. Okay, so what did you put? I mean, I because I talked to a dear friend of mine who said I took like he's like I couldn't even think straight because you right. know he had like an hour or two to pack and he packed his car because and he literally saw the fire coming. He's in Colorado coming along and he's like, oh my gosh, and he said he took pictures, but it wasn't like he could, like you can't think because you're on a, a panic. But no. now I guess. What would you, now that you've gone through this, your wife, you know, was prudent and she was like, led this effort. What do you, what would you pack now? Like, what would you start? Like, is there like a checklist of like, go and start packing yeah. these things and what would they be? Yeah. So, uh, the LA County fire department on their website has a checklist and they actually, it's, they, they did a great job on this. They have the five minute checklist, like you have five minutes, this is what you grab. They have the one hour, you've got an hour, this is what you grab. They've got the, you've got two hours, this is, you know, so each list obviously gets longer and longer of the things right. to remember to get. Um, and do you have that on your website too, Robert, or could you send it to our listeners so they can see? Sure, absolutely. If they if they go to my website and they email me for the list, I'll send them the links okay. to that. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay, got it. So robertkerbach.com is where yeah. you can find the preventative measures you can take for the home. And then also um, things that you want to do to kind of, before, like right before, 